All right, we got that going. And hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, yes. Got All it. right. There we go. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Eleanor Rangers, uh, president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. I'd like to welcome you all to our um, May. Um, oops, I'm just seeing periodically some people coming in, so you'll see me click on the screen. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for this evening's webinar. We'll introduce Ron in a few minutes, but as usual, I have a couple of introductory remarks to make about our organization and what we do. We are um, celebrating our 11th year, actually, uh, still going strong, uh, as you can see, with our ongoing programming offerings. And uh, as you know, uh, many of you, we are uh, an organization that is dedicated to collecting oral histories uh, of people that were involved in Cold War related activities, primarily in the southeastern Pennsylvania area. Um, and uh, we have actually approaching over 120 interviews that we've conducted over the years. Um, and we are continuing to, uh, to actually do that. So we thank those who uh, have been willing to give their time to, um, to our group to uh, be interviewed. Um, as you know, obviously we've gone virtual for these uh, webinars and uh, um, you know, I can see at least for through 2021, I can anticipate that we will continue this uh, virtual webinar series. Uh, this is just a listing of our upcoming programming. Um, just want to let you know next month, uh, we have a twofer. We have actually two guest speakers uh, on one of my bucket list topics. I have been wanting to schedule some lectures on uh, the former uh, missiles uh, that were used during missile defense from the um, uh, Cold War. So in June, we have David Stumpf and Greg Devlin speaking on the Titan missile program and the Damascus incident from 1980 in Arkansas. Actually, Greg was a firsthand witness to that event. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to a discussion about the history. And David's actually returning in November to actually talk about the Minuteman missile program. He has two mm -hmm. books published on these uh, respective missile programs. So I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, some great, uh, great talks about those two, like I said, bucket list programs. Um, and in July, actually, uh, we have Jess Sheschel, another another program I'm really looking forward to. Um, he will be talking about his book on John Glenn, which gets released in June. Um, as we've reminded people before, this is the centennial uh, year of uh, celebrating John Glenn's birth. Um, so, and as, as you may know, he did train on the Johnsville Center Fusion Warminster. Uh, so we're looking forward to that talk. Uh, and we have some talks on the dinosaur program, Project Man High, which I'm also looking forward to. Um, and we have Michelle Evans coming back in October to talk about Mike Adams and the X-15, the only casualty of the X-15 program. And, uh, and then as I mentioned, the Minuteman program. Um, and then we will close out the year uh, with a panel discussion of people that were involved with the operations uh, and uh, research and riding the Johnsville Centrifuge. So uh, another program um, that I I'm sure will be a great one. And uh, you can find these information about these programs on our website, uh, as well as on our Facebook page. And you can always reach out to us at our email address if you want to get more information as well. So, you know, one of the big questions I'm starting to get is, so when are you going back to live programming? Uh, well, um, as I said, I'm probably going to be, you know, I'm going to be riding out this year with the webinar series, but I do know that the, um, the Fuge, the old Johnsville Center Fuge, which is now an event center, is actually getting back up and running. I know they've actually built an outdoor pavilion and they just had um, a prom there last weekend. And it sounds like they're getting busy again, which I'm really happy to hear. Um, and I need to reach out to um, the owner just to kind of find out where things stand. But I'm tentatively looking to kicking off live programming um, again in 2022. So you'll get more information about that as we move uh, into the latter part of the year. 
And also, um, I do get periodically questions about, hey, I can't make this webinar. I wanted, wanted to hear the topic. Um, you know, do you record them? And uh, yes, we do record them. And I've been housing them on our uh, YouTube channel, um, which is under our name. So if you look us up on YouTube, you can find us. And there's a lot of other little interesting tidbits, some other uh, videos and things that may be of interest there, but we do uh, happen to archive the webinars uh, there as well. So, and these webinars go back to June of, uh, of 2020. This is our website, coldwarhistory.org. This is also a site if you wanted to check out the other things that we've been involved in from an historical preservation standpoint, in addition to the oral history work that we do, um, definitely uh, check that out there. We do have an events page that we keep updated there as well. If you're ever in doubt about uh, or missed an email, you can always check out the events there as well. Um, and I do also post the Zoom links um, for these webinars the day of the uh, event. I do update our website as well. Um, and for those of you that are on social media, we have a Facebook page, uh, so you can certainly uh, check us out there. I do try to keep that updated as well with our events, and uh, occasionally we'll supplement that with some other articles, uh, Cold War-related articles that, uh, that come forward. Um, and if you are a veteran from the southeastern Pennsylvania area, uh, we'd encourage you to check out our Wall of Honor that we kicked off last November. Um, and I uh, would love to have you contribute a um, contribute to that page with your own biography, or if you know a family member or friend who was a uh, resident, form, current or former resident, uh, living or deceased, um, who was a veteran, we'd love to have you contribute their biography as well. So uh, please, by all means, check that out. It's SEPA, Southeast PA Veterans.com. Um, also, some of you may, who are on our email distribution list may have seen a program that I sent through, uh, I think, late last week. Um, this is actually um, a series of webinars that the Cold War Museum uh, in Virginia actually sponsor. And this is uh, one event that's coming up uh, next Sunday, um, interviewing an uh, SR-71 pilot. Um, I'm actually hoping to, to listen in on that as well. Um, if you go to coldwar.org, you can get more information. I believe that this is one you have to sign up through Eventbrite, and there is a nominal charge for the event. Um, but uh, they do have some interesting programming, uh, and I would encourage you to check them out as well. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we operate on a shoestring, but... Um, you know, certainly we do appreciate if you so choose to make a donation to our organization. We do have a donate button on our website. And another easy way to make donations to the organization is through smile.amazon.com, where a small pro amount of your purchases on Amazon and who isn't using Amazon these days uh, can go towards our organization on a quarterly basis. So just wanted to mention that as another uh, manner in which you can donate if you so choose. And again, as always, thank you no matter what, for your continued support and enthusiasm for our organization and what we uh, attempt to do. So without further ado, let's go ahead and introduce our guest speaker this evening, Ron Creel, who is a retired space and thermal systems engineer. And uh, he is, uh, resides- Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I don't know why my, <laughs> my phone suddenly decided to activate Siri. Um, Ron is from Huntsville, Alabama. And um, fresh out of college over 50 years ago, uh, Ron actually was, as he puts in his own words, thrust into a challenging and high-speed engineering task to design, test, verify, and provide mission support for thermal control system for the thermal control system for a new kind of spacecraft on wheels, which was the Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle. Um, and this, of course, was a highly successful program. And Ron, of course, has received. Uh, not surprisingly, many awards, including the coveted Silver Snoopy Award for his work on the uh, uh, Lunar Rover program and other mission support efforts for the program. So this evening, um, Ron is going to share his experience uh, with the Apollo Lunar Rover program and also uh, talk about uh, his knowledge about the, the corresponding Russian Lunacod rovers, which is another fascinating uh, piece of history that I think not, not a lot of people know about. So I'm gonna turn things over to Ron and I will be driving the presentation this evening. So 
bear with me for a moment to switch out presentations. And there we go. All right, I'll hand it over to Ron. Are you gonna see my picture up there? Or, uh, I need to go back one slide. Go back one slide. Oh. All right, right here. Uh, well, there was a cover slide. I guess you changed the cover slide. Uh, what I'll say is that, uh, uh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Uh, yes, tonight I'm gonna to talk to y'all. Somebody's got a live mic. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Eleanor? I can hear you, no okay. problem. Um, I Very would good. ask if everyone else could mute um, or I will be yeah. muting you myself. <laughs> right, okay. Okay, is my picture giving, is my face being shown people? Not that I have to have it done that, but. Uh, I can see you, so I, I believe that, that it is visible to others. Okay, very good. Okay, let's get going. Uh, I, I'm very happy to talk to y'all about this. Uh, you're gonna hear about an uh, interesting story in, embedded in this, but uh, uh, certainly uh, we, uh, I worked on the project that was parallel to what was going on in Russia. Although uh, I think, uh, and I try to show here that uh, they landed two of their little rovers on the northern part of the moon, and we had our Apollo rovers in the middle part of the moon. And this picture down at the bottom kind of gives you a comparison of the different sizes. Our vehicle weighed about 460 pounds. Theirs weighed about 1,800 pounds. Theirs only moved about a tenth of the speed at max of what we went. We went about nine miles an hour. Um, they, they only went maybe a tenth, uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.8 miles per hour on the moon. And uh, let's go on to the next chart. The space race. What started the space race? I remember very well one day when I was coming, I was in the sixth grade, I was walking home from school and horns were flaring around and people were getting out of their cars. They were all upset because the Russians had launched a satellite. It's called Sputnik. And I very vividly remember that. And uh, that, uh, that uh, upset a lot of people. And uh, that was the beginning of the Cold War space race. Uh, the Russians, uh, as you see in the left side there, uh, the Sputnik, Sputnik, Sputnik didn't do much more than just to send a beeping signal, but it still was a major accomplishment to put a satellite in orbit. And nowadays, by the way, the Air Force is tracking 27,000 satellites in Earth, low Earth orbit around, around the Earth. It is getting very crowded up there. Uh, uh, down the lower picture there, uh, left side, is uh, Yuri Gagarin. He was very much celebrated, uh, many medals. Uh, he was very brave. Uh, and uh, he set the, set the course for the beginning of the space race. Uh, certainly uh, over on the far right side there, uh, uh, President Kennedy, we'd already done, John Glenn had done that orbital mission in early 61, uh, early 62, sorry. And uh, then the president uh, surprised a few people, uh, probably not the least of which was president, Vice President Johnson, with saying that, hey, we're gonna set a goal of getting to the moon inside the decade, the decade of the 60s. And uh, it is very regrettable that he did not ever get to witness that himself. Uh, the Russians did have, we, we had our Saturn, big Saturn rocket, that's smaller Saturn rockets, and we had the big Saturn rocket that carried the lunar module you can see on the right side there. The Russians also had a program called N1 slash L3. And that would have had a single lander, a single person lander with the big N1 rocket. The N1 rocket had 30 engines on the first stage. They never could get those engines to work together. Uh, we only had five engines on our vehicle. And uh, by the way, the Saturn V, uh, out of the 12 vehicles that got launched, there was never a failure. Let's go on to the next chart. Space race got started in uh, 1960, uh, 50, 1957, sorry, 1957. Uh, I've got a question for y'all. I must mention here the 18 moon landings, but I want to first ask y'all, what I've got up there in 1975. What happened in 1975 to end the space race? Anybody got an answer? Everybody's muted, I guess. Apollo Soyuz. Apollo yes. Soyuz. Apollo Soyuz. That's exactly right. That was a, the beginnings of a pseudo space station in orbit. Was the Apollo Soyuz mission, even though it was still uh, very much in the Cold War was still ongoing. Cold War ended about ninety one with the coming down of the wall and uh, etc. Uh, I've tried to portray here that there were during that period of time from nineteen fifty seven to nineteen seventy five, uh, no fewer than eighteen moon landing missions. Uh, the Americans, we launched a series of, uh, down the lower right called the Surveyor spacecraft. And in fact, even one of those uh, Surveyor missions was visited by the Apollo 12 crew later on. Certainly over the left side, I've got the two, the, uh, all the Russian lunar missions, and I've specified there what the Lunokhod 1 and the Lunokhod 2 missions were. 
that uh, landed uh, in uh, one in 1970. Their little uh, robotic rover was actually landed on the moon before our rover in 1971. And uh, so this, this slide gives you kind of an over, overview of the, uh, what I call the 18 missions during this, this space race. Let's go on to the next chart. And uh, I, I do know, I wanna tell you all that uh, the moon is a very harsh environment, uh, but our uh, portrayed here, you have re repeating 29 and a half day cycles. 14, 14 and a half days of uh, sun, and then 14 and a half days of no sun. This causes quite a sweep in the temperature of, of the moon as shown on this page. Our lunar more, our, our vehicles, the lunar module and the astronauts and the rovers were only designed for a short period of time during the morning, morning, morning period uh, on the moon. This is also to do to, uh, it gives better TV pictures too that have the sun, sunlit pictures. Uh, the Russians, however, it always uh, found out information that, that, that they, were, they were planning and, and their, their Lunacod their vehicle was gonna go for uh, as long as they could go. But actually the, the final result was uh, for a Lunacod one was 11, 11 of those cycles, which is shown there the full spans from, from uh, about uh, 220, 230 degrees Fahrenheit down to minus uh, 280, minus 300 Fahrenheit. And, uh, uh, I apologize if all y'all want me to talk centigrade, but uh, I talk Fahrenheit. Uh, even though uh, uh, in the program, we actually use all four different temperature scales and sometimes it got confusing. So let's go on to the next chart. That's, that's our environment. Uh, I try to show, let's talk now about the, the American system. American system uh, landed uh, 12 astronauts on the moon, six different missions, Apollo 11, 12, 14, then 15, 16, and 17. 15, 16, and 17 were the three missions that I worked on where we developed and gave them the rover. The rover fit inside, it was folded up and fit inside the lunar module. That picture down there with the astronaut holding that tape, he's actually about midway through the process of unfolding the rover from the, the descent stage of the lunar module. And uh, that, uh, that was a very successful uh, project. In fact, that was something that was only proven maybe two or three months before the first delivery that they could actually accomplish that successful it's no, doesn't do you any good to get the rover up there to the moon if you can't get it out of the lunar module. But they, they worked that, they, they worked out fairly, very well during the missions. Uh, there's the three, on the far right is the three uh, Apollo landing sites. Uh, the, we went the farthest north uh, on Apollo uh, uh, 15, the farthest south on Apollo 16, and the farthest to the east on Apollo 17. And uh, they're now talking about missions going down to the South Pole, because they have some indications of there might be water down there, frozen water. I don't know if it's on the surface or underneath the surface, they're gonna work on that. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna show you all the LRV number one. This is the only film that we have of a rover driving on the moon. And I'll explain what it's all about. Uh, uh, Eleanor may have to break away uh, or the way these uh, hyperlinks work. It's not working today. So she's gonna go out, she's gonna call up that video and show that to y'all. And uh, this, this is the only pictures we have. This was an experiment to try to, we painted white, white and black stripes on the wheel hubs and on the side of the chassis, and they were gonna do an experiment on Apollo 15 of driving along, have a, have a film, uh, other astronaut filming that drive-by drive -by called the Grand Prix. And uh, that would give them information about the relative slip between the wheel, with the wheels, how, how, how much time are they actually engaging on the surface of the moon? And uh, so I think she's gonna find it over there. Sometimes these technology systems don't work exactly like you like to have them. She went to the next chart. Still there, Eleanor? I'm here. Did did what? No, it didn't I, show the didn't, didn't show the movie. Did you go over and show oh, the movie? Oh, it didn't. Oh, it didn't no. show the movie. I thought it did. Oh, I could see it on my screen. So oh. hold on, just a oh, minute. Okay. Let's try. I, it I didn't again. see it here. I don't know if people saw it out in the, out in the world or not. <laughs> I don't know. Did anyone see it? If someone can unmute. I didn't. No. No. no? no it's, it didn't. It didn't show. So okay. try it. Try, try it again. Go back. Try it again. Because I do want y'all to see that. What was interesting was we want to do that experiment on Apollo 15, but and the astronauts did it. But it turned out that the camera, the film cartridge in the camera back in those days, it uh, it jammed, and so there was no evidence of that. So they repeated that on Apollo 16. What you're going to see is Apollo 16 when we repeated that was called the Apollo Grand Prix, Rover Grand Prix. All right, I Ron, I'm going to try playing it from your um, OneDrive uh, and see if that can get it to work. 
Okay. Okay. All right. I want to point out some things there. Hopefully, that y'all can see how. Can you see it now? No, no, still don't, still don't see it. Yep. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know why it's not. Uh, I don't know why it's not playing. It, it's probably a control within Zoom that I'm not familiar with. Oh, yes. Uh, well, we we'll have that. Uh, Eleanor will have it, I guess, and she could show it to y'all at a different time if you if you call up the address. And uh, 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 what I could say, what I wanted to show, state to y'all was uh, you see the rover driving along. Uh, as Buzz Aldrin said, uh, when he landed on the moon, Apollo 11, he called it magnificent desolation. And it is that. It, it is amazing that over the billions of years, how much bombardment of meteor, meteors and meteorites has caused this dust to be created up on the moon, this surface layer of uh, several, several centimeters, several inches of uh, lunar dust. And uh, that's what we had to contend with. That's why we had special wire mesh wheels on the rover. Let's go on to the next chart, Eleanor. So the movie's not gonna work. Because there's a movie on this one, I have to describe this movie too. This, this picture shows me at the uh, model, thermal model control console. We did testing and then we correlated our thermal models based upon that test data. I'll give you a few, a little more information about the rover. This is a, an animation done by a friend and in, in, uh, uh, some cart, uh, graphics done by a friend in Canada. Uh, and uh, we use that, uh, we're even gonna have a planetarium show using these, those images here coming up for the 50th anniversary. This summer, July 30th is the 50th anniversary of the landing of Apollo 15 on the moon. So we're gonna try to have a little ceremony. We have to be limited attendance. Well, I, I don't know, this new guidance today, is that gonna open up, uh, like we talk, Ellen and I were talking about, it opens up to, so that people can go in and, and not have limited seating. But how do you know whether somebody's had the vaccine or not? That's, uh, we'll talk about that. That's, not, that's, a, that's, a, that's a side issue. Uh, this whole thing has been a, a, a big impact on everybody. There is Rover, it was a four wheel vehicle, much like your, you, your cars that you have. You know, although uh, it was independent motors and drive system on each wheel, you know, each, each, each motor, each, each, each wheel, such that if a, wheel, if a motor had bound up, they could go in with a little tool and pull on, pull on a little lever and uh, disengage that wheel and do what's free, called freewheeling. You could have driven with only one wheel operating with a motor system, but that never happened. We never had to disengage any of the any of the wheels. Uh, we had a control into the display console shown on the right over there that gave the astronauts uh, information about uh, where they were. They would initialize the navigation system at the at the at the uh, lunar module, and they used the sun as a reference. And uh, then they would uh, drive using a hand controller that fitted with their gloves with their hand glove hand gloves, and. Uh, they, that would, the information was there to give them temperatures, uh, gave all the switches, you could turn systems on and off, turn the nav system on, uh, uh, turn the gyro, and essentially, essentially like that. Uh, we we did, did work, the uh, uh, main thing that impacted us was dust. Uh, we did have, we provided that, uh, we, we assumed that uh, the mobility system, the wheels and everything would be covered with dust. And uh, we have, uh, but, but, and we had in the forward chassis, area, which is up there between the two front wheels, the two front wheels. That's where we had our batteries, the computer, and the drive control electronics. They were, they had radiators that were, had a dust cover on top of them. I don't think that movie's going to work either. Uh, if the other one didn't work, I was going to try to show you the only thing we, we originally planned that the astronauts, all they had to do at the end of a driving period, they got back to the lunar module, they would open up the dust covers over the radiators and the radiators, the radiators would cool off the batteries. Well, we got dust on the radiators and we could clean it off very well. We didn't get very good cool downs. Uh, so we had to battle that. In fact, the plot over here on the left side shows that um, on Apollo 17, we started out hot and uh, then we, we kept being fairly hot, but we were able to uh, have them open the covers when they were out there on a, during an extra vehicle activity. When they drove out to a site, we had them stop and open up the covers. They, uh, that wasn't the original plan, but it was a backup plan to do that. And it worked fairly well. As you see, there's my, my silver Snoopy. That is the best award I ever got. And uh, I always tell the side story here that uh, to get that, good cool, that, that cool down on Apollo 17, uh, another friend of mine and I, we were called down to the Cape a few nights before they were going to leave to go to the moon. And it never struck me until I got on the airplane coming back. My God, I had been there in the room with two men that were going to the moon. That's the Apollo 17 crew. And uh, I, I asked that question. I see a good question. I'll, I'll talk about it while we hear it. Uh, and uh, uh, the two men that were going to the moon 
and the two that had been, been to the moon. The Apollo 16 crew was the backup crew for Apollo 17. And that to me is still is a major event in my life that uh, uh, just sitting there talking across the table with these gentlemen, uh, these very brave men that were gonna get in that rocket. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, uh, Gene Cernan, uh, Apollo 17, he's passed away. Uh, uh, there's only now three, uh, three of the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 astronauts alive. Dave Scott on Apollo 15, Charlie Duke from Apollo 16, and Jack Smith from Apollo 17. The other astronauts have passed away. Uh, let's go back to, I'll tell you about the NAVS case. Generally, when I'm talking to the kids, I ask them, I say, how did we navigate on the moon? We didn't have a GPS system like, like we've got here on the Earth, satellites and to, to give you the information. Uh, I won't, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer the question for y'all. Uh, what, I, I ask them, I say, what did we use to, to navigate? And they say, use the stars. Well, we used a star. We used our star, which is called the sun. And the way they did that was, there's a little box on the left side that's got a little red flag. It's, that's, that's a remove before flight, a, a remove before flight flag. That little box there, gave them, when they sat there by the lunar module, they would get the pitch, pitch there, then they would rotate that little, dot, that little box around and would get roll, roll. And then there was a little device on the top of the top of the, there's a caution and warning flag is open on the top of that console. And there's a little black lever that they lift up and that gave them a shadow, gave them a roll, it gave them yaw, gave them yaw. So if you've got pitch, roll and yaw, that's what you need in navigation to set your initial heading and to uh, tell, the, tell the computer, here's where I am. And so they torque up the gyro and start the gyro up, knowing that new initial information based upon the sun. I think systems like that are still, it worked very, very well. When they got back to the lunar module each, after each driving period, they were within a, with a tenth of a kilometer of distance showing on the uh, dial. You needed to tell the astronauts, they wanted to know what heading they needed to go to different sites but you also want to know what's my, what's my bearing back to the lunar module if I, have to, if I have to turn around and go back. Also, how far away am I from the lunar module? That was all computed. And each, in, inside each wheel, each, every time the wheel went around, it gave nine pulses. And they used the fastest, of, uh, fast, well, they used the left, rear, the left rear wheel to give them the best information they could get for distance of the wheel. What's the wheel? Now you have to factor in there some slip because these are, this is an off-road vehicle, very, very, very off-road. And uh, as such, you need to have a provision there for uh, putting a little slip in there. We had about 10% slip. That's the time that the vehicle was aloft and it was bouncing around off, up off the surface or uh, grinding away. And uh, they worked out very well. The navigation system, like I said, got them back. Very, very good information. Uh, let's go on to the next chart. Okay. Uh, we, for Apollo 18, there was an Apollo 18. Uh, there were 18, 19, and 20 were originally, originally planned. And we had a fourth rover that we were trying to rig up for Apollo 18, thinking about it. But in succession, due to budgetary constraints and the Vietnam War going on, uh, or beginning and spending money on that, uh, we started losing missions. We lost Apollo 8, 20 and 19 first, and then Apollo 18 fell also victim to the budget, budget constraints. In fact, there were several, I'm, I'm really surprised after Apollo 13's uh, calamity that we even got the other missions doing, uh, uh, to, done, but uh, Perseverance uh, uh, got us through. And uh, we were studying for Apollo 18, how we go about living through that 15 days, almost 15 days of nighttime on the moon. So we had a survival program that we looked at. We found out as shown on that plot, this plot here that it would take about uh, 40, close to 40 watts to keep the uh, battery system uh, 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 within temperature constraints uh, during that period. And uh, conveniently, uh, the Apollo lunar surface, there was, there was on five of the missions, there was what's called the Apollo lunar surface experiment package where they left sensors on the moon. And those sensors were, were powered by what's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, RTG. The astronauts put it, took, a, took a, a canister off the lunar module, took it out there, took a rod out, the isotope rod out, and then they put it in the middle of this assembly shown on the left side there, inside there. And that generated the heat, which is converted into electricity. Not too dissimilar to what you got in nuclear power plants, really. And uh, so we were working on that. We were gonna, as you see in the lower lower part down there, we were thinking about putting a trailer, having a trailer there that they that they put on the back end of the rover after they'd done their, their driving around. And this, we would then have a robotic rover that would be powered by that radioisotope, the RTG. 
And uh, we, were, we were about ready to do that, uh, but then uh, Apollo 18 was canceled. And that same time period, let's go to the next chart. That same time period, I subscribed to a magazine called Aviation Week and Space Technology. Many of us called it Aviation Leak, L-E-A-K, because it was our source of information about different programs. And uh, they, were, they were reporting regularly about, uh, as you see down there on the left side, it's an article there about, uh, about the, the, about the uh, uh, Russian rover, Lunokhod. The Lunokhod is shown here on the middle picture on the top there of actually deploying off of their lander and uh, driving, uh, beginning driving. I was, in, I was, I was amazed at, uh, to know, uh, I wondered, you know, how did these guys, how did they survive during the night? Uh, during that for, uh, nearly 15 days of nighttime period. Uh, so I was hungry, hungry for that information. Uh, we're in the Cold War. We didn't get much information out of people. But then the next chart, let's go to the next chart, Eleanor. Lo and behold, after Apollo 15, in the fall of 1971, this document, I hold it up. I don't know if you all can see it in the picture there. This document appeared on my desk. I could not believe it. It was a full description of their whole system put in a fairly large book, nearly 200 pages, showed me every detail. And it showed me how that they had used a heater on the back end of their Lunacod up on the left side there. It's got a heater uh, that, that they close the, close the lid and they'd hibernate, but that heater, the heat source allowed them to blow, blow air, blow the, blow the atmosphere by inside and keep everything warm inside that container. And you can see the temperature plot, the temperature plot there on the, on the left side. Uh, this is amazing to me to have all this. It's a translated document too. Now go back, please. It's a translated document. It wasn't even in Russian. It told me everything I wanted to know and I got it, uh, just delivered it, it dropped it on my desk. I still don't know to this day who put it there on my desk or how I got it. But it's uh, amazing to me to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to get that information. Uh, and it's, uh, that's got me started talking to the Russians uh, ultimately, uh, late, much later, much later. And uh, it, uh, it used a, a different isotope than we used on the RTGs. It used the polonium-210, uh, which has a shorter, shorter half-life. Uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, it was amazing to me to have that system described to me. And I, I, still, didn't, I didn't, still didn't know one thing, though, know, that was why did the first one, the first one, their first Lunacod last for 11 cycles, 11, 11 months, and the second one only lasted for four months. Let's go on the next chart. Okay, I wanted to first off tell y'all that a friend of mine up at Brown University has done a good comparison here of traverses on the same scale, showing you the, uh, the different distances gone uh, uh, by the different vehicles, both the Lunacods on the left, that's the black and the red, red plot. You see the Lunacod two went much further, as I said, during the 11 months. Our missions were only three days, three days 15, 16, and 17. 15 is the purple. 16 is the green, and Apollo 17 is the blue. Those were uh, driving periods. But you can see you can see how much further distance you went away from the lunar module on those missions than, than Apollo 12 and 14. In fact, on Apollo 14, they had a cart that they carried behind them. Uh, it had wheels on it, it had two wheels, didn't have a motor, but uh, they dragged it along. They tried to get up the, uh, the edge of a crater and they were so overtaxed on their system that they, uh, they just had to finally say, hey guys, we're using too much oxygen, too much, wa too much water, we've got to stop. So they had to walk back. Uh, the rover, when the rovers, des rover, rover, rovers delivered, they gave them a greater capability. They could sit down. When you're driving in your car, you're much more relaxed than trying to walk or run around. And uh, that's what you got from having a, a good, good vehicle on the moon. And you can see the different distances. We went much further. Although the record on the moon is held by the Lunacod number two. Uh, but Lunacod number two, I'll tell you a story here, ultimately. Lunacod two, why did it only go four months? Uh, next chart. Okay, after, okay, now we've had, this all happened very deep into the Cold War space race uh, up through the year 1972, 73 for the Lunacods. Uh, I, uh, I did contribute to uh, 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 what's called the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. If y'all want to look that up on the internet, Apollo, Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. And uh, I think that's where the Russians found my name and I they found my reports that I was giving back in the time frame of the 80s and 90s and uh, trying to tell people what went on. And uh, so they invited me to come over to Russia in uh, two, 2004. 
So I got the visa, which is not easy to do. And uh, uh, I went over there. They actually invited, we went into the, this facility on the upper left-hand picture. This is a real Lunacod design and engineering facility in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, uh, over on the far right is a, the uh, uh, a picture of uh, uh, what became a good friend is General Dovgan, Vyacheslav Dovgan. He was the actual operator who joysticked their, ro their robotic rover on the moon. And uh, uh, you can actually see him in the bottom right there presenting me with the Spoot Sputnik medal, which is also a cherished medal that, uh, that they gave me and is in my collection. I'll pass it on to my grandson maybe someday. Uh, by the way, my grandson's name is Calvin Apollo Creel. So uh, they, they took that name, uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, here you see on the lower left here, this is me making my presentation similar to what I'm talking to y'all about, about the systems that we got on the moon, the, the, our American system, uh, and talking in their, in their, right in their test facility. And uh, it's a very, very good trip. Next chart. Okay. Uh, Russians, I won't go through all the wording on this chart here. You can read it maybe later, but uh, uh, here you can see a picture of uh, one of my hosts, Mikhail Malenkov, and some of their, their design engineers trying to describe the wheels. Their wheel was different. It was a spoked wheel, but it, uh, it, uh, it worked very well for them. Also, I also was wondering, hey, how did the, how did the, how did the uh, uh, wheel survive? Uh, I told you how the big compartment had that gas system. With the, with the radioisotope heater that they could, they could pass by and get heating heat for, to keep it warm during the lunar nights. How did it survive the lunar nights? How did the, how did the drive motor survive? What they basically did, they had good, good uh, this special lubricants in there and they actually sat there. They waited until about two days after the sun rose the next time before they would try to drive around. So they let the system heat up. And uh, uh, so uh, I, learned, I learned that by, and it turns out the Chinese have done about a similar thing with their little U-2 rover that they put uh, on the, uh, uh, the first one on the, uh, the near side of the moon didn't work, but the second one on the far side of the moon is working right now. They have to go through the same. Then there was also the concern about, uh, I've tried to convey to other people here, when you go up there and you move around on the moon, you're gonna be subject to uh, having to stop operating uh, a day or so before lunar noon and a day or so afterwards. That's because you can't drive around or even try to walk around. You can't see the terrain uh, in front of you. It's, uh, there's, it's, it's washed out, it's washed out. They explain that to me. They also, General Dovgan, I, uh, uh, we could go on to the next picture, next check chart. Uh, General Dovgan, in one of these gardens up here in the middle, up in the gardens, uh, he, we had a translator. I finally got him to explain to me what happened on the, the second lunar cog, why it, why it failed. And it was about lunar dust. Uh, they were, he, he maintains that uh, uh, he, he went home one night and there was a different crew came on board to, to run, to, 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 do, to do the mission it's during a daylight period. And as such, the crew started to go down into a crater that was too steep and it started to slide. Their lunar cod uh, started, started to slide. So they, whether they, they wouldn't say they panicked as much as say they, they, they quickly shifted into reverse. But when they went, try to get back out of that crater, the open cover caught on the side of the, of the, of the crater and captured a goodly amount of uh, lunar soil. So later on, when they got to the, near to the nighttime, they would close it up. That soil was dumped in on the radiator. The solar panel was inside that lid, but it dumped the dust, dust lunar soil onto their radiator. So the next time out, the next time when they got going, the next time they over temperature and they failed. And uh, it, was, it was interesting that uh, to get him to say that and, uh, uh, admit that uh, that was the problem. And uh, even though that vehicle did set the land speed record on the moon, and uh, they meant take us to many, they, had, they were excellent hosts. Uh, they took us to many, many, several, several uh, museums. There's a lot of the uh, uh, artwork was saved from the German invasion. It was, was saved in St. Petersburg and they have some magnificent uh, artwork and, and such in these museums. And uh, also I'd like to picture over here on the left, that's Gretschko. He was up there on their Salyut uh, space station uh, missions. And uh, of course, that was several years before 2004, but I uh, uh, got to meet him. And uh, the, uh, as my host, uh, one of my other hosts over here, the beautiful churches in St. Petersburg, lower right over beautiful churches. That's us. It was October. It was starting to get a little bit cool, but it was not too bad. Of course, now, whenever you go out, you must have a toast of vodka. That is the uh, standard practice. And uh, 
it does help warm the system up. Next chart. Since since uh, since uh, the Cold War is over, and we and obviously that 2004 trip was after the Cold War is over, but uh, we've continued to share uh, different information, different uh, uh, about our American rover and about the Russian rover. I share. I sent them all uh, uh, some rover posters that my friend in Canada made, and uh, they were very proud of those, as long as well as a, a, a CD-ROM with with our presentation on it. Over on the right is a different sharing team. I was invited to go to this, this presentation in uh, 2019. Uh, probably should have gone then because they've had it now in 2020 and we're planning for 2021, but no, we're not, I'm not gonna be able to go in either one of those years. And, uh, but they, they try to share amongst their, they have a, a historical society much like Eleanor's that, uh, that tries to uh, learn from old experiences. We've even after, after, actually uh, also shared uh, uh, computer aided design models uh, I sent them the, uh, the, the one on the lower left there, different assembly parts uh, that we use for 3D printing. And they printed up the fellow, the colors aren't exactly right in the version that Dimitri did, but Dimitri did a pretty good job there of 3D printing out and assembling that model. And uh, he sent me the Lunacod, but the Lunacod, the uh, wheels, I showed you the spoked wheels on the Lunacod. We can't really do that in 3D printing over here. So we, I've, we've had to simplify it. And I've not ever gone back and put that model together. But uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a task for me to do here in the future. Uh, next, uh, next chart. Okay, this is where now we won't be able to show typically at the end here. This is a, 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 a simulation game that I've developed and had some folks, even some folks in Poland uh, help with some programming that takes, the, it takes lunar, lunar reconnaissance orbiter data. And we, then you, drive, you can drive the rover around to different sites and uh, have temperatures up in the upper right-hand corner of the systems displayed, as well as uh, be able to drive it with a joystick. They have a, we have a joystick they can use. And uh, if the movie had worked, it would show up here. I have a movie that showed the uh, 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 camera on the rover panning around, looking out into y'all, into the audience, looking for a question. And it focuses in on a person's eyes. So I say, oh, there's a question. And now I guess I'm open to questions. I already answered one about the uh, navigation system. I'm welcome to answer any questions that y'all might have. That's fascinating. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off, um, Ron. Mm -hmm. What uh, dictated the shape of those Lunacod rovers? Because they were obviously so divergent from what, you know, the manned Apollo ones, but any any insight to that at all with that strange circular look to them? And Well, no, I guess it just fell out that that was the best way that they could put all those different systems together. Uh, having the, the isotope heater on the back end, you notice it had a had a deflector on it to keep keep the real hot temperature away. OK, and uh, then uh, it's, it's like a pressure cooker. It's like a little pressure cooker. Think about a pressure cooker. And uh, that's how I compare it. Uh, and uh, Plus, they were going uh, much slower. They, their system was very heavy, uh, but uh, they had done they had done a lot of testing and uh, and proved it out that it would work. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, they uh, they uh, uh, were able to uh, they uh, on the lander. They, they're different than us. They didn't fold their vehicle up. Our vehicle is different. That it had to fold up so that it could fit inside the lunar module. Theirs theirs was uh, landed totally ready to go but they lowered some ramps down on, on the two different sides because they were a little bit concerned about a different slope. If they were in a crater, uh, wanted to make sure they get the rover off and they, they did, they're very successful in that. And uh, uh, we had one of our missions where uh, I think Apollo 15 landed with uh, one, of the, one of the legs suspended over a hole in the crater. Uh, that was the biggest slope challenge that we had. And when they went to deploy the rover, it stuck a little bit, but they were able, now our rover now, if 460 pounds on the earth, I asked everybody, uh, what did it weigh on the moon? It's one sixth of that, or it's about 77 pounds. So they could pick it up easily and they, they pulled it out, got it to work. And if they got caught in a, uh, on a big boulder or a rock in a crater and uh, couldn't move, uh, got, uh, they could get off and they did on occasion get off and actually pick it up and uh, move it around. Hmm. Um, we actually have, have a couple questions from chat. Uh, one is, why were none of the missions near the polar regions until now? Well, that's that's a that's a, a multi-part answer. Uh, in going to the moon, the moon uh, it uh, it it does 
you, you want to stay for, for energy management of mass, for mass propellant mass that you need. You want to have flexibility and margin, and you get the best margin by going to uh, uh, lower latitudes, lower latitudes. Uh, go, so go, trying to go up to the poles, North Pole or South Pole, you've got to change the plane of your orbit, and that's going to take more energy out. And at the converse, when you leave the moon, you got to get, get, get back into the plane so that you're in a good level plane here so that you can come back and land uh, here on the Earth. Uh, and uh, typically the missions, even out in the Pacific, they landed close to the equator uh, and the same thing on the, uh, some Atlantic missions. Uh, so it's, it's a balance there of uh, trying to, uh, 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 in, the, in the, days, the early days here, uh, we didn't have quite the amount, the energy also, it's also a matter of, we were all exploring, all, all brand new, it was brand new territory, didn't have maps. And it was all learning, learning to go, uh, Apollo 17 did go into a valley between some mountains. It got a little more adventurous. Uh, going to the poles, there is good evidence here that those, those areas are very, very, very rocky and very, very, uh, very, very challenging. In addition to low lighting conditions, they did, uh, uh, they're gonna have to have uh, vertical solar arrays on the vehicles uh, such that they can catch this little bit of light that they get down at the pole. And that's why the poles have a concentration of their potential for ice down there just like our poles on the earth that uh, uh, now you don't have an atmosphere on the moon, but you still, you still got the solar energy is less at the poles, uh, just from the dynamic, the, the roundness of the, of the globe. Here's a, so what's our question? Why were the astronauts concerned about navigation? Couldn't they simply, well, uh, they wanted to, when, when they go out exploring and you go away from the lunar module, you wanna know where's your home base at all times. That's the main thing. <laughs> and also I will say, you also want constant communication, okay? Uh, they, we had, uh, uh, the astronauts had low gain antennas, they had antennas on their backpack, such that they communicated back to the lunar module. They also, when they were out at the sites uh, where they were driving around and got off the rover, they would point the high gain antenna back to the earth. That was the main method of sending the TV signal. Uh, the, the Apollo 15 had the first color TV camera on the, on the moon. And they got some very good uh, images, some very good movies. And it's very good to have that communication, voice communication through those antennas, and then to have the uh, TV picture, uh, constant TV picture. And Eric said, Apollo 16 was going to be, the, I've got the TV guide, that it was going to be the big publicity mission, okay? Going to be timed such that it got out there, such they'd get out and do the driving around during the prime TV coverage at night, the prime time, prime time, okay? Uh, when they got to the moon and got undocked, they had an antenna issue, which meant that, or some kind of an issue with the propulsion system. So that it made them delay the landing, okay? They didn't go back and dock, redock, but they, they, they essentially delayed the landing. And that, that put them into a situation where the crew had already been up for a long time. So they delayed, that threw them out of the primetime TV coverage. But I still have that TV guide. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. These are good questions. It's good. It's good audience. I told you that's a smart audience. I'm very, yeah. I'm very blessed. <laughs> and by the way, I am writing a book. Someday I'll get it out published, which I'll tell all these things in some form. Although uh, sometimes the publishers they they kind of balk at memoirs, uh, historical memoirs. But uh, y'all probably know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a question. You mentioned about this game. Um, is that available for purchase or is it online or how can people access that if they want to drive their own virtual lunar rover? Uh, we're not to that point yet. I've had that question asked many times. Uh, I, I, it, uh, it would take a little more uh, funding from my side here to, uh, to uh, uh, make some advances in it. It, it works pretty well now. Uh, it, it needs some improvements. Uh, I, uh, I still have been reluctant to put it out into the world there of, uh, uh, they have gaming places where you can send the game off and they'll, they'll uh, give you a commission on it or whatever. I'm not so much concerned about the commission on it as much as, uh, as uh, uh, how much does that put me in front of people that I've got to spend time with that, with, uh, with uh, that I, I may not have the time anymore. <laughs> I get involved in a lot of volunteer efforts. I work with the ham radio folks on, I saw, saw that, uh, I guess it's uh, uh, Jim, Jim's a ham. 
And uh, I'm now working on the uh, next CubeSats called Golf, Greater Orbit, Larger Footprint. And uh, so I'm doing thermal analysis for those guys, volunteer. And uh, uh, that, that, uh, that's a good activity for it. Keeps me busy here. It's something I can do here at home. Hmm. And, uh, Has NASA reached out to you in planning for the Artemis missions um, for any insights you know, about in a, your experience with the rovers? In a, in a way, in a way, uh, I had a presentation yesterday to what's called the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium that's uh, helping that was, that's the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab leads that. That's the agent for NASA to, uh, to try to do the planning here for the, for the future missions. And uh, yes, they, uh, uh, they do listen a little bit. They, they have their own mind. It's almost like they, they, they're at the cusp here of they wanna try to reinvent the wheel or do things differently. And so that's what I'm up against sometimes is uh, uh, when you talk about the dust, I'm firmly convinced that we must do everything we can to isolate the astronauts from that dust at every juncture. Uh, have suit covers, have airlocks, have suit ports that leave the suits outside, uh, much like you'd have in Antarctica. Antarctica, you use mudrooms, what they call mudrooms. I like, to, I like to have mudrooms on the moon where they come back from being, exploring outside and they leave the, uh, they leave the suit outside. Uh, that's not universally accepted by the folks so at NASA. And uh, uh, I'm afraid that uh, they may find that uh, trying to go up there and clean things off and spend it. That's the other thing is, I don't want the astronauts to have to spend as much time. When we got through with the mission there, Eleanor, uh, the final mission of Apollo 17, my senior mentor and I, we just sat there, wiped the sweat off our brows and we kind of said, gosh, we had the astronauts spend far too much time doing housekeeping trying to clean off radiators, uh, trying to po point the vehicle in certain directions. And uh, we got to get beyond that. So uh, uh, that's my future, that's my future challenge for them. And some few listen, uh, I keep, I keep preaching, but uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, beyond, you know, beyond just the, the issue of just dust collection and interfering with the electronics and, and the machinery, um, there's also concern that the dust itself can, can um, induce uh, an allergic reaction. I mean, Har Harrison Schmidt actually reported that. Um, yep. And I think this one is. of the technicians after the return of Apollo 17, when they went into the command module to retrieve equipment, uh, mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. sneezing. So there, there's some, oh, yeah. there's a lot of health implications of that regolith that's you know beyond just the physical that's not so great. So I, I agree right. with you, regolith's a problem. Right. The particles, by the way, they're very, very sharp. On the Earth, you've had water in, interfacing here that's caused a smoothing out of the particles of, of the sand that we have in this particle dust. That's not true on the moon. They're very, very sharp edges on, the, on the, a, lot of the, a lot of smaller particles, uh, smaller pieces. And uh, that's what can get into the lungs and you can't ever get it out of the lungs. Uh, so uh, that's been my approach here. Keep the dust outside of the vehicle and outside of their lungs. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let me ask you another question. What do you think of the, uh, any comments on uh, the Mars, uh, you know, ingenuity and perseverance and a oh, lot of you know, excitement over the helicopter? Oh yeah. Uh, JPL is fantastic. I have been, I worked out there in, in California for a couple of years and uh, they invited me to come up there and uh, give my presentation about our rovers. And they took me into a, what's called a, a think tank where they were, they would give it, give issues on you know, issues on, on problems to be solved, and that different groups were in different system engineering groups, and they would work out a solution. And they are very very sharp. Uh, that what they've done, uh, just think about the different landing methods that they've imposed. You've seen before the bouncers that uh, bounced and the pedals opened up and, mm -hmm. the, and the vehicle came out. Then this latest one where they have actually have a, a, a parachute system that lowers it and then uh, the, the tape drops the last few feet. Uh, very ingenious. Some of that has to do with mass and, uh, and, and uh, but also uh, the, uh, the uh, I'll tell you about dust on the moon. The uh, Spirit and Opportunity had uh, solar panels, okay? Uh, one of those two, I think it's Opportunity. Ultimately, they, they would have periods of time when dust would get blown. They had wind on them, there's wind on the moon, on Mars, wind on the Mars, wind on Mars. And the dust got so bad on one of those vehicles that it shut it down. It couldn't, so it couldn't collect the solar energy to operate. But then uh, magically, uh, maybe a month or so later, a couple months, 
wind came back up, blew the dust off the, the solar panel. But they got smart after that. They said, we're not going to be dependent. We don't want downtime. Okay. So they went to this big, uh, you saw the little radioisotope some thermoelectric generator we had on the moon for those ALSEP packages. They went to what's called a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, MMRTG. That is much more powerful and they don't, they don't have solar arrays anymore. So they've got this hanging out the back end is that assembly you see there. That's their, that's their big RTG, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator that's providing all their power without the sun. And uh, by the way, the sun's intensity is much lower at Mars than it is on the moon or on earth because it's farther away, from, Mars is much further away than the, from, the, from the sun. So, uh, uh, but they don't use solar panels and they got, got around the dust problem that, that way. Hmm. Very, um, very ingenious, very ingenious. Ingenuity about flying around, oh, that's an interesting little uh, experiment. Uh, 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 people immediately ask me and say, well, why don't we do that on the moon? We don't have an atmosphere at all on the moon. There's very little on Mars. There's much, much, there's nothing on, on, on the moon. Oh, so <laughs> aerodynamics not not exactly existent on the moon. Um, the uh, can you tell the group? Um, I guess I have two other other questions. The Lunacod mm -hmm. Operations Center was not in Saint Petersburg. That was at I believe no. like another location in Russia, in a, a I guess a secret base or military base. Can yes. you tell the group about it, that? It was. It was. It was. I don't know the name of it, but it was down closer to Moscow. And uh, uh, I don't know if it's still in existence or not, or if it's been changed over to and upgraded to other missions, how many other missions. They, uh, they also, they, they use their own antennas to collect data. Uh, we use our American system. We, have, we actually have an antenna, big antenna in Spain, as well as uh, other, uh, other sites, uh, other antennas. Uh, so their, their antenna systems are, are different placed around, around Russia that supply their, their innovation. Uh, the Chinese are very interesting. For their backside, their, their far, by the way, please everybody, don't call it the, the, the dark side of the moon. It's not the dark side of the moon over there. It's the far side. On the far side of the moon, they have the same cycles of hot and cold, sun and no sun, that we have on the near side of the moon. So uh, I hear people saying uh, the, the dark side of the moon. There's no such thing. But, uh, but the point is the, the Chinese are very smart. They put a satellite in orbit, what's called a Molnia orbit, up, up above the North Pole, such that it covers, it allows them to communicate from their rover on the far side up to that communication satellite, then beam their information back to the Earth. So, uh, so the, moon, the moon would have blocked the signal if you not had capability to do that indirect, uh, the bouncing, send a beam up uh, to that uh, satellite. And uh, they've done all that. So, uh, uh, well, I don't, maybe, this, maybe there's going to be another space race here. Uh, uh, it is ironic, I think, that the reason we all we got to the moon here was the, uh, the Cold War space race. Uh, and uh, as I said, very ironic that President Kennedy did not ever get to see that to come to pass. That's very unfortunate. And, uh, very, uh, we all went through that, lived through that. Yeah. Um, and something else that um, I'm not sure if the group, group knows, but I don't believe that NASA originally had plans for a rover and that was it was it actually um was it general motors that actually approached uh nasa and specifically von braun uh, with this rover concept well no they, we had been studying uh, here at marshall the marshall space flight center and uh other places uh dr becker was the main person and uh they they were study, studying mobility on the moon what uh frank pevlix from general motors what he did was he had a little model that uh, uh, he, he, and maybe the story is a little bit exaggerated here, but he did take that up to the headquarters building here in Huntsville. And he, he uh, had the secretary open up uh, Dr. Von Braun's office door and he ran this little robotic model into there. And uh, so Werner Von Braun did say, ha, oh, what do we have here? And uh, he says, we must do this. But it was more that uh, they had already won the contract to, to develop, General Motors already been the subcontractor. Boeing was the primary contractor, but General Motors was a subcontractor. And uh, they'd already won the contract. It was more just a demonstration of, hey, this is what it will look like. And how it showed how, they, how you fold it up and put it, you had capability. That was a major accomplishment 
was being able to fold, fold them forward and, and aft chassis and then the wheels folded up themselves. Wheels, when they contacted, here's the interesting thing for y'all, when the wheels were folded up to keep, the, to, such that the, to, to, to allow the, the wire mesh wheels to touch each other, you had to roll this, the, the fender, there had to be a section of the fender that was on slides that you rolled back along the fender. And that, but that came into play later that when they got to the moon, they would always deploy the rover and they'd pull these fender sections back, these what's called the fender extension back, okay, to get better, better fender coverage. And uh, as such, the, uh, on Apollo 16, uh, Apollo 15, they lost the, the fender extension on the, on the left front. That didn't give them any bad, bad effect of getting dust on the astronauts because the dust was thrown forward up there on the front end. Apollo 16 and 17, on both those missions, the commanders caught a hammer in their suit under the edge of that fender extension on the right rear, on the right rear fender and popped it off. That was a major concern because that caused a rooster tailing of the dust being thrown up on the vehicle. After Apollo, happened on Apollo 17, uh, uh, happened early in the mission, such that uh, John Young from Apollo 16, he was the backup commander. He, he was given the task of going in and finding, finding a solution. The solution was they took some maps out of the lunar module. They would take some, they, they would ultimately have the crew on the moon, take some maps out of the lunar module, tape them together with duct tape, good old duct tape, <laughs> and then take some clamps and actually come out and clamp that onto the right rear fender. And it fairly, it worked fairly well for the rest of the EVA and uh, e EVAs that they drove. But uh, it was interesting to me that, uh, 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 that uh, I ironic, once again, irony here that uh, he was involved in the uh, knocking it off on the Apollo 16, then he was signed to fix it on Apollo 17. And by the way, John Young was a fabulous engineer, a fabulous person and uh, a real go-getter, a real dynamic. He's the first pilot of the space shuttle. And I don't know if y'all remember that he got people a little bit upset when the space shuttle came in and it landed and it proved that those tiles would work and to take, take the heat. He got out, he got out and ran down the ladder there and was going around and looking. They didn't want him out there doing that at that time. They had a lot of gases being uh, <laughs> spewed out or systems being uh, vented. And, uh, but he was, he was the kind of guy, he was going to see, he was going to go out there, he was going to look over his vehicle. It's like his car and uh, uh, see if it worked and it did work. And uh, he, was a, he was a great guy. Yeah. We actually have a, a question from chat. Um, mm -hmm. Why did the Russians abandon the Lunacod program after only two successful missions? Uh, it's, remember, remember now, they had already seen that their big moon rocket had failed. The big moon rocket had four, four big explosions. In fact, in one of those explosions, it was a loft over the launch site and it killed a goodly number of engineers and technicians and people in that area. So they had a, a bit of a bad history of that. Uh, Lunacod, uh, so I, I, I kind of gear it into that, that, hey, it was more that they, uh, and, and the fact that, yeah, you'd had a couple of successes. It was more that, hey, they wanted to move on to other projects as we, as we said uh, to them, the work in space station type projects was of more interest. Uh, that's, that's why the, uh, they, did, they worked on the Apollo Soyuz more actively uh, to, to get, get involved that. And now you have them being a major partner in this International Space Station. Uh, in fact, the first module that put up for the International Space Station, that is a Russian module, the power module, uh, the core, core. That's where they go when they have solar events. That's where they go for protection because it has a lot of beef, a lot of mass to it that help them uh, prevent from. And that's another thing, going up to the moon, You've got, you've got no protection on the earth. We've got the Van Allen belts, which deflect those bad solar particle events that happen, uh, gamma rays, x-rays, et cetera. And you don't have them on the moon. So uh, that's gotta be prepared for uh, with all these missions. We were very fortunate in all of our missions that we didn't have any solar flares to interrupt and, uh, and, 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 and cause problems. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that, that, and nobody's ever had theory here, that those come in series here of solar events, two or three at a time uh, in one year and, and it stays off. Uh, we were very fortunate in our couple of years that we were doing rovers that we didn't have any major solar flares. Yeah. Uh, Ron, yeah. I have uh, two questions. Sure. This is Jim. So hey, the first question is, what's your call sign? Uh, I'm, I'm not a ham. I'm not a ham. Oh, not I, a I got ham. I got in, I got involved indirectly through another ham out at Marshall oh. Space Flight Center, Heidi Heidi Havlin. 
Heidi Havlin, and uh, uh, they, they got me, uh, hooked me in at, uh, uh, they knew I was doing thermal analysis. Could I help them with the, uh, with the, uh, the golf uh, CubeSats? They're going up from little foxes where the, where the uh, uh, one cube, one U, what's called a one U cube, that's 10 by 10 by 11 centimeters. Now they're going up to a, a three U, which is a, a larger and has solar rays. It's, it's going to be a, a much more challenging uh, uh, mission. It uh, has star trackers and uh, gyros. It has the uh, spinning uh, flywheels in there. It's, a, it's quite a project. And uh, oh. they're going to try to launch, uh, I think, next year. OK, well, second question. Uh, have you seen the, the show for All Mankind on Apple TV? Uh, no, I haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't watched that. OK, well, that, that'll negate the third question. I was, they, they show a lot of the rover. Uh -huh. There, I was just wondering if you ever get a chance to watch it, it'll be interesting to see what your, uh, your, uh, yeah, is, uh, your depiction. Right now, I have been in uh, a movie called Moon Machines. If you get over there, you can find a movie. It's called Moon Machines. They did. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting to me that uh, uh, American film companies didn't really pursue this very much. Maybe they've done it lately, but uh, during the, the Cold War and other time, even after the Cold War. Did pursue the people of Canada came in. They were making this movie called Moon Machines. They got one on a Saturn V rocket on the command module, and they got one on rover. And I was in the rover one. Uh, only, only talking about our. Uh, I didn't tell you all about uh, for thermal control. We had ten pound budget. Ten pounds out of that four hundred and sixty pounds. That's why we couldn't do. We sat there after the mission and we said we would have loved to have been able to have a closed up system with what's called an ammonia boiler at the time that would have not had the astronauts had to be involved at all trying to brush off radiators or anything. But we didn't have that weight. Uh, we only had 10 pounds. So with 10 pounds, we had thermal straps from, strap one from the gyro to one of the batteries was a thermal strap. And then the other one was a thermal strap from the computer into the other battery. And then uh, we had a, a what's called a fusible mass tank, a, thermal, a, a passive thermal control uh, wax box. We call it wax boxes also, where you have a fin assembly there that has wax in between it, and it, it helps you as a, as a thermal damper, a thermal damper to, to, to slow up the heating point. Then when they open up the covers and they radiate, radiate the heat away, the wax uh, 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 solidifies again. And uh, so we had two of those uh, on there. And uh, I couldn't get into too much of the thermal detail piece. I was going to talk to you more about the Russian and the Lunokhod comparison and, uh, and uh, learning from them and being able to go over Russia. That was a big adventure. For those of you who haven't um, seen the Moon Machines series, um, I can attest that is a phenomenal series um, about, you know, we know all about the astronauts, but this was about all of the, a lot of these ancillary mm -hmm. programs and the people behind it. Yep. And um, uh, if I can, I'm pretty sure a lot of them are up on YouTube and I can um, try to pull those into our, um, I can, um, actually try to uh, add that to our um, our YouTube channel as well. Um, and Ron, if you're okay with uh, my posting those movies, I can add those as well so people can see those after the fact as well. Sure, I, I don't think there's any problem with, uh, with doing that. Uh, they, uh, uh, they did try to market them for a while, but uh, now the internet has kind of taken over all of that, that uh, uh, you're, you're better off to uh, publicize on the internet uh, and try to get some funding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, any other questions before we yep. wrap up here? Yep. My phone, I had my phone just start ringing too, just like Eleanor's. And there, there's the other phone. We've got, we've got a spam phone. We've got a house phone where we take spam calls. And uh, so our cell phones are... Uh, also available. We need All to get right. rid of that spam, that spam phone. We do get well, a lot of spam, a lot of spam. You'd be amazed at what they'll try to sell you. Oh yeah, well, if I don't recognize the number, it, it, it goes to voicemail. Right. Yep, you got it, you got it. All right. Yep. So, well, Ron, this was fantastic. I'm so glad that actually, I'm not sure if uh, he joined us this evening, but Jim Shear from NASA, um, mm -hmm who's also a fellow docent at the Smithsonian um, had mentioned you, your name to me. So I'm grateful that I was able to, um, you know, make the connection. So 
Um, really appreciate it very much and fascinating topic. And um, I certainly learned a lot this evening and very much appreciate it. And uh, um, I'm so glad that we, you were able to uh, make this happen. Right. Well, it's good. It's good memories. And I uh, uh, don't know if we get to go back to Russia, but I'd, I'd like to sometime. And uh, I've been to Ukraine too. On, oh, wow. on a different rocket pro a different rocket program and uh that was interesting because ukraine second world war we, we're not a lot of us are not familiar with the second world war what all went on how many thousands how many millions of people died mm. uh, in russia and uh, ukraine and other areas that uh that 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 helped i think in the war to to, to blunt the german efforts there into a different arena uh and uh allowed us to come in in france and to proceed forward and uh, that, that was the ultimate uh, doom of the German program. But uh, uh, it, was, it was a bad war and uh, my father was in it and uh, uh, he luckily wasn't injured or anything, but uh, in fact, he would never would share with me. I would used to ask to try to get information out of him. He never would say a word, mm. never, never a word. Mm. It, was that, it was that much of an influence on people. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thank you very much, Ron. Um, and keep us posted on the book. So, uh, oh, you know, okay. when the when the book's published, maybe we can have you have you back. Maybe we can have you back in Warminster, and uh, I can give you a tour of the centrifuge, and we can do a book signing. Oh, that, that that's an idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. So there's some motivation to finish the book. <laughs> oh yes, incentive. Yeah, like the incentives are given for the uh, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine now. <laughs> Exactly. Free scholarship, somebody. Ohio, Ohio's got a free scholarship and a million dollar prize. It's like my wife said, they're not doing it for us, for us folks here that took it when we were supposed to take it. <laughs> well, and they're offering, I think, free Lyft and Uber rides now to vaccine centers through July 4th um, as an incentive to get the vaccine, too. Yep. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Well, all thank right. Well, thank, thank you all. You. Thank you all for listening and uh, the good questions and uh, 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 I haven't been stumped yet, but uh, uh, you can tell I've, I've obviously I've been asked a lot of these things before, but uh, it's good, good questions, good questions. And, uh, uh, All right. Well, enjoyed it. Well, thanks again. We will post this to our YouTube page. And like I said, I will try to also retrieve the Moon Machines episode and these other videos that I unfortunately was unable to show everyone. But uh, thanks again. We will see you guys next month in June for the uh, program on the Titan Missile Program. So once again, thanks and uh, thanks for your support and have a good evening, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, Eleanor, you too. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Welcome, you're welcome. Well, thanks, Ron. You're very welcome, Jim.